G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel, continuing this little series I've got uh, where I'm going through all 18 teams and doing a little bit of a, an analysis. I don't even really know what to call it, um, but sort of going through how 2023 went, where their best 22 is at, um, or at least my attempt on their best 22, uh, looking at some acquisitions, who they lost in an off-season, and perhaps an outlook for next year. So uh, I've obviously started doing it in reverse order of the alphabet. So I've done two videos so far, the Western Bulldogs and the West Coast Eagles. I've created a playlist as well if you want to go find those specific videos as well. And today we're going to be doing the Sydney Swans, which means next will be St Kilda, and then so on and so forth. Like I said, I don't know how often I will do this. It depends on whether people keep watching them. But uh, I'm going to have a crack at talking about the Sydney Swans today. Before I get into it, if you could do me a favor and consider subscribing to the channel. Got this audacious goal of hitting 25k by the start of the new year. So if you're enjoying the content, it would mean a lot to me if you consider subscribing. So let's talk about the Sydney Swans. Uh, obviously, 2022 was a bit of a, maybe not out of the box year for them, but it was probably a little bit of a jump up in terms of like how good that team became in a very short space of time, being uh, the runners-up in 2022 was a little bit of a surprise. And as such, on the grand final, uh, obviously we saw a very, very one-sided performance where the Cats absolutely smoked them. There tends to be this uh, response, this little statistical quirk, perhaps a statistical, maybe there's more to it, where teams that get smashed in a grand final often don't come back the same team the following year. There's a few exceptions, but uh, to be honest, with Sydney, like looking back on their 2023 season, I don't know how their fans feel, but if I, I gather that perhaps there's a there's a feeling of mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, things didn't go right. There was a lot of adversity, some disappointing moments for sure. But overall, I think to make the finals in the way that they did and uh, you know were pretty competitive in the final they did lose. Overall, I think there should be a degree of satisfaction with the way they sort of rescued their season. And on top of that, you consider as well some individual performances, development of players, er Errol Goulden uh, exploding this year to become one of the best young players in the competition. Perhaps the best true wingman in the competition as it currently stands at just 21 years of age. Um, so that, and along with some progression of others, I think uh, overall there was definitely things to be taken out of this season for the Sydney Swans. So in 2023, we saw them have uh, 12 wins, 10 losses, and a draw, and obviously losing to that red-hot Carlton side in the first week of the finals, which, like I said, was a pretty good final, and the Swans were competitive in that game, absolutely. Uh, one of the other things that was a feature of Sydney's game style this year was probably their pressure, uh, which is a pretty good achievement as well when you consider as well. I felt like maybe a lot of players were playing underdone this year where they had a horrid injury list, particularly to key position players. Their back line was decimated. And like I said, to rescue their season and eventually make the finals and then be the second ranked side for pressure this year, there's, there's still a lot of positives, even though they dro dropped, what, six spots on the ladder. You know, Sydney, for the first time in... in the Probably the first time I've been watching football, sort of in that late 2010s era, was the first time we saw Sydney really drop out of uh, finals contention. Obviously, a couple of bottom four finishes, or at least one. I didn't write that part down, but whatever it was, their, their stay towards the bottom ladder was very, very short-lived, and their ability to acquire talent and draft well. Obviously, there's a little bit of a, an academies factor as well where they have benefited from that, but on top of that, overall, I think the list rejuvenation has gone down very quick. And now what we see here is quite a age diverse list, still a lot of gun veterans um, and still you know a lot of gun youth players and even players in their prime. So I do think they have quite a nice spread, but I think what this year also kind of represented is a little bit of a changing of the guard uh, in terms of, well, obviously, you know, now it's the post Buddy Franklin era um, and some unfortunate retirements this year, in particular, Paddy McCartan, Tom Hickey's also retired. So there's a few uh, gaps on the list they needed to plug, and that's what we saw reflected in their offseason. But again, in terms of 2023, you know, um, there were some good things out of it. As I said, Golden um, coming on and exploding the way he did. Braden Campbell, another top uh, six pick, top five pick in 2020, also having a, a bit of a breakout season, you'd say. They got a bit out of their medium forwards this year, obviously, like without uh, Buddy Franklin obviously kicking a lot of goals in a given season. Tom Papley kicked 37 goals. Isaac Heaney probably didn't have his best year, but he still kicked 30 goals. Both of those guys were dangerous at times, and both of them also, you know, had a little bit of impact in the midfield. In fact, Papley, uh, his ability as a clearance midfielder at times this year was something to contemplate going forward as well. But overall, I think the key position uh, injuries that they sustained this year ultimately held them back a little bit. Uh, obviously, Paddy McCartan missed time. Uh, Tom uh, Tom McCartan missed time as well. Sam Reed had a seizing injuring uh, hamstring injury, if I'm not mistaken. Buddy also missed football, had to retire, um, you know, sort of prematurely, I guess, in the sense that, uh, well, his last game, he was subbed off due to injury. And Tom Hickey, again, as well. Missed some games this year. The ruck became a bit of an issue. But I think with their offseason, they were potentially 
uh, move to sort of rectify a few of those issues. So we'll talk about some key exits that happened for the Sydney Swans this year. Obviously, Buddy Franklin, the biggest headline there. Paddy McCartan as a key defender, um, unfortunately retiring due to those concussion injuries. Tom Hickey, their first choice ruckman. They did offload Dylan Stevens as well, which is worth considering uh, given that he was a top five pick not too long ago. Uh, and then there's a few other delistings. Ryan Clark was one of them who uh, surprised me a little bit. Maybe I need to watch closely, but I remember him being a good tagger at some point. Uh, but to talk about their signings, the, the players that they brought in to, to rectify uh, some of these list gaps now. So Brody Grundy also comes in obviously as their number one ruck choice, which is a, an upgrade on what they previously had. Um, you know, Peter Laddam sort of didn't have the season he would have liked. Uh, I know they've got McAndrew as a young ruck there. They've drafted Will Green now, but Brody Grundy comes in uh, for that immediate improvement to their best 22. We saw Taylor Adams request a trade, surprisingly, uh, which I think was Adams-driven, but nonetheless, he's ended up at the Sydney Swans, which has been pretty timely, obviously, given the Injury to Callum Mills, um, which uh, happened on Mad Monday, didn't it? They also recruited Joel Hamling as a key defensive stopper. After they, uh, It sounds like they were the, right in the mix for Ben Mackay as a key defensive option. Failed to get him. Even though there were a few key backs swirling, they didn't end up with um, one of the more high-profile ones. They decided to go for Joel Hamling, who has missed a lot of football. And it's towards the end of his career. But nonetheless, he comes in and potentially plays a fair few games for them next year. In line with trying to improve their midfield depth, James Jordan also joined as, joined as a free agent. So there's a lot of players there that will probably feature in their best 22 acquired this offseason. And I will give you the best 22 shortly. We also saw them draw, uh, draft Will Green, the, the young ruckman. Caden Cleary joined through their academy. Patrick Snell, from memory, was a Brisbane Lions academy player. They've drafted him as a key back. And also chucked in uh, Jack Buller as well, who they drafted in the mid-season draft. A 22-year-old young key forward prospect. So let's have a look now at their best 22. And I've highlighted the players in yellow that are new to the side. So... Uh, Hamlin comes in at full back. Uh, him and McCartan, probably the two key backs there. Taylor Adams and James Jordan have chucked uh, into the best 22. Brody Grundy, of course, as well, is the uh, starting ruckman. So one player I've left out of here is Callum Mills. Uh, he's obviously best 22, but I decided it'd be more helpful maybe to plot their best 22 because Callum Mills, we know, is going to miss... Is it half a season? I'm not too sure. He's certainly not going to be there for round one. Um, there's a few unlucky players I missed out, and that uh, probably speaks to some depth that Sydney have. Cunningham, Francis, Melican, Fox, probably the next bunch of players in. Um, and then Sydney fans will probably have some opinions on which other players might, uh, might feature in this side next year. So some general points on their best 22. I mean, Adams and Jordan, I think, were timely recruits. Obviously, Callum Mills missing. Uh, but there's a good blend of experience and youth in that midfield now with Grundy, Adams and Parker in particular being the more experienced types and then Goulden, Jordan, Chad Warner of course as an on-baller as well. So there's some real gun young mids there and a couple of veterans there to support. As far as their forward line goes, obviously this is now life after Buddy Franklin and I think what we've seen from Amati and uh, in particular Logan McDonald who I think is a really top-end talent you do get the sense now that the, the transition now to this next era of their forward line uh, is in fairly safe hands. I'm not necessarily suggesting either of them will become Buddy Franklin, but there's there's two players that sort of can offset each other well. McDonald kicked 30-odd goals last year as well. Um, I think he's only 21 or 22, so he's got still some time to develop, but they've at least got some tall targets there with some talent. Um, and then you consider their medium types as well. And Tom Papley is obviously an absolute star. Isaac Heaney has flirted with stardom over the time of his career and, you know, still could be like a top-line medium forward. I mean... I think there's a 50-goal season in Isaac Heaney. It's still waiting to happen. Um, he just probably needs to get his kicking boots on for a start. Uh, but, you know, between hit them and Haywood, um, I think that is a really dangerous mix. I have chucked Sam Wicks into their best 22. I don't know how popular that decision is going to be. I think he's around the mark anyway. Um, but whether or not there's Sydney fans that think somebody else should be there. But I think his defensive pressure probably offsets what Sydney also have there in terms of goal scoring power, which they definitely do. And Hayden McLean as sort of that second ruck uh, primarily a forward. Their back six is looking pretty settled, you know, provided there's no injuries. It's pretty experienced. You got Lloyd and Rampy back there, obviously. Um, now, um, obviously, Hamling too. So there's, there's experience there, there's Blakey, um, and then I've probably, in this team, I've probably picked Braden Campbell as more of a running defender, even though I think he's probably gonna play on the wing. So this is where I'm not really too sure, but I, I felt like I probably had too many midfielders available. Even though, you know, before this off season, it was suggested that Sydney were trying to bolster their midfield depth. 
I actually found it harder to um, pick the next defender in. That's maybe Cunningham, maybe it's Francis. Um, you guys let me know. But Campbell potentially is a running defender because I didn't pick one on the bench, but we'll see. He's either, either way, he's in the best 22. The one vulnerability I see with this team, um, and I think this is evidenced by the fact that they did try and go for Ben Mackay, was the lack of a real tall key defender. So Joel Hamlin comes in, he's only 194 centimeters. Tom McCartan's 193. Even Melican, maybe the next key defender back into the team, is also 194 centimeters. And even their draftee and Patrick Snell is only 194 centimeters. So Ben Mackay is obviously on the taller end. I think he's two meters tall, right? Um, potentially they're gonna be looking for someone who can really play on those 200 centimeters key, uh, key forward talls because that is gonna become a more and more common thing as, uh, as drafts go by. There's a lot more two meter monsters getting drafted. Um, as an aside, I did hear that they had shown some interest in West Coast Harry Edwards. Harry Edwards is uh, obviously probably not gonna be very well known and still obviously trying to make his own mark in the, in the Eagles side, but uh, he is a 200 centimeter key defender with some degree of talent. So perhaps that's one Sydney can monitor. I did hear that they were interested in him and he's out of contract the end of 2024. So Potentially, they could get him as a listed free agent. Who knows? But again, it's probably just that that height that they're lacking. Um, maybe Adam Tomlinson, again, from the Melbourne Demons, whether he's going to be available, whether he is that true lockdown defender, I'm not too sure, but he's he's 199 centimeters. Anyway, I'm rambling a little bit here, um, but obviously I think like the plus of Brody Grundy to come in and consolidate that ruck quality, as well as Taylor Adams in that team, we know that there are Pretty dynamic duo when combined as well. Could we see Sam Reed back into this team? Again, uh, that's one I'll probably defer to Swans fans to let me know. Obviously, he uh, I think he had a hamstring surgery in July of last year and was delisted and re-rookied. So I'm not sure where that sits in terms of him coming back into the side, but I do probably, from the outside looking in, guess that he's probably going to be depth cover. To be honest, when you've got Amati and Logan McDonald, it's probably time for them to shoulder more of the load, uh, provided they have a successful season. Some other things that I think they could consider addressing with their list, and they're, they're probably all over it, but um, I noticed with that back line as well, there's some aging medium defenders. Is there, is there prospects waiting in line for them to come in and replace Jake Lloyd and Dane Rampey, for instance? I think Dane Rampey's the oldest player on their list now. Um, I know that last year they drafted Cooper Vickery, Caleb Mitchell, a couple of uh, medium-sized defenders, and I don't know a whole lot about those two. There's also Robbie Fox as well, but perhaps that's something they could consider with their next little phase of their list transition. Again, uh, a more permanent key, uh, KPD option, key defender. Joel Hamling is probably more of a stopgap. And I do know that they've got one coming up in their academy this year who's probably projected to be about a second round pick. His name is escaping me, forgive me. Um, but aside from that, I'd probably be scouring the free agency market, even the delisted free agency market, maybe Harry Edwards, again next year uh, for a ready-made key defender who uh, has more than two years left in his career, to be honest. Maybe a small forward option. I do know they drafted Constanti last year, but from what I've read, didn't really set the uh, world on fire in his first season in the reserve. So we'll see what happens there. Um, obviously, it's early days. I'm not, not trying to write him off, but uh, that's something to consider. I do think one big thing for the Swans going forward into 2025 and beyond will be the contract of Logan McDonald. They, um, they really don't want to lose him because he's uh, arguably their crown jewel. Obviously, it's Errol Goulden as well, but I think as far as key forwards go, Logan McDonald, as I've talked about a lot on this channel, I think is uh, has that real top end potential and is someone that can build their forward line around going forward. Maybe the next thing they need to consider as well is transitioning in new midfielders for you know Luke Parker and Taylor Adams. I think uh, Taylor Adams is 30, Luke Parker is 31. And players tend to have long careers at Sydney. So perhaps they're not like, you know, 24 months off retiring. Probably not. So maybe Luke Parker's got three years. I'm not really too sure. Um, and looking at the next batch of midfielders, Angus Sheldrick, who I've selected as the sub in this best 23, um, is probably one that I could foresee getting a bunch of games this year. Other than that is Corey Warner, Roberts, and then of course their most recent draftee, Cleary, as well. So We'll wait and see on those types. I don't know too much about Matt Roberts. I know he was drafted in the third round of 2021, I think it was. Um, so we'll see what happens there, but potentially more midfield depth through the draft specifically could be one avenue Sydney look at. So I just want to clarify something. I just realized uh, I said Adam Tomlinson as a uh, key defensive target. I actually meant Dougal Howard. I was thinking Dougal Howard. He's 199 centimeters. Anyway, I've been kind of rambling about what I think of their list and their best 22. Or maybe I've really talked about their best 30 or so, but... 
In terms of prospects for 2024, I don't see any reason why Sydney's not in a position to challenge again for, you know, at least top four. I'm not going to necessarily say they're up there with the top contenders next year, Collingwood, Brisbane, etc. There's still a bit of a gap there, but, you know, I felt like a factor this season was fitness, um, specifically injuries, but also perhaps players looking a little bit underdone. Um, you know, it's, it was very un like for them to go to GMHBA and lose by 90 points or whatever it was. Um, so it's, there's something else there. Considering as well, you know, Sydney are pretty good at GMHBA traditionally. I don't recall them ever playing poorly there. In fact, they smashed West Coast there once, but I mean, against Geelong. And then further to that, they finished well and truly above Geelong this year. So uh, that one was a bit of an odd performance. But like I said, like I think the key forwards are probably developmentally somewhat ready to uh, to take more of the burden this year. You know, maybe Logan McDonald kicks 40-odd goals. I could see that being realistic. And if he does, that will be a huge boost to Sydney. I think the recruits of Grundy, again, I'm not going to back him in necessarily being All-Australian, but playing as that primary ruck um, with tapping it down to Adams and Parker and Chad Warner and Errol Goulden. Uh, that's a that's a formidable midfield mix there. Maybe it'll take time to gel, but either way, I think they've addressed their weaknesses really well. There's some dangerous foot skills in that midfield too. Goulden, uh, Braden Campbell, two of the better kicks in the league, um, just about. And Chad Warner probably still has levels to his game that he could reach. Um, so there's there's a balance of good, experienced players in the here and now, and there's also some genuine upside from players that are incrementally improving. Obviously, football development doesn't always happen in a linear way. But you can really see reasons why Sydney could improve next year. So where do I see them finishing? I, I did that. I think I've done two ladder predictions so far already. I'd say top six. I'd say top six. If they don't get a home final this year, I'll be surprised. But I wouldn't go as far to say uh, that, that it's a massive failure either. Because like I said, I still think a lot of these players have, are years away from hitting their prime. You know, Logan McDonald, Braden Campbell, Errol Gould and Chad Warner. The, probably the four best young players I, I can just think of off the top of my head for Sydney. Who still have their best football ahead of them. I know Sydney sort of aims to be one of these perennially competitive teams and they are successful at doing that and have been you know other than that like three-year rebuild they did they have they've been very successful at it so i'll be very shocked if they're not competitive again i do think they probably need to go to the um the ready-made talent market next year in terms of a key position defender specifically uh, but other than that i think it's pretty smooth sailing for the swans and i do see them being competitive again uh, and i mean legitimately competitive again in 2024 so those are my thoughts guys i hope that ramble kind of made sense uh, but let me know in the comments what you think of what i've said in this video changes you'd make to the best 22 i should really call it a best 23 um, but yeah thank you very much for watching guys and we'll do st kilda next at some point and uh, i'll see you in that video cheers